He is a registered physiotherapist, certified nutritionist, and a SFMA and FMS practitioner, or maybe used to be. And he is now just recently started as the performance nutritionist at True Protein. So he is now my colleague, Scott Tyndall. Welcome on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You have <clears throat> been helping athletes in all kinds of sports from rowing to ice hockey, sailing, even fighters, I believe. But I've got to ask you, it's actually one of my favorite questions that I never really ask. I don't think I have asked this on the podcast before. As a nutritionist, what did you have for breakfast today? Uh, I actually had overnight oats with Greek yogurt and raspberries in it. And then I had three eggs scrambled with uh, some olive oil. And then I had a protein shake with uh, uh, actually WPI 90. And, uh, <laughs> Product placement yeah, straight yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, creatine and uh, some whole milk and uh, some frozen raspberries in that as well. So I had a lot. Wow. I went for a swim this morning. So I did a K in the ocean. So Fair amount of calories there in the morning. <clears throat> Is yeah, it, how, it was probably a little bit overboard. So yeah, I'm do you sorry. generally have a big breakfast or not? Uh, not recently, actually, because I've just come back from eight months traveling and I've been a bit out of condition. So yeah, <laughs> I sort of have been doing a bit of a twelve eight sort of thing. Uh, uh, sorry, sixteen eight, and uh, just eating from twelve o'clock to eight o'clock at night. Um, you mean intermittent fasting? Yeah, pretty type much. If you style, want, if yeah. you want to call it that. Yeah, so 12 hours <laughs> off eating and eight hours eating. No, sorry, 16 off and um, yeah, 16, eight. So oh, wow. 16 off, eight on. So from 12 to eight, I'll tend to eat. Okay. Main reason for that, honestly, is just so I don't eat too much. <laughs> wow. Okay, so you, you're very different to me. I, I struggle to eat enough, I believe, during the day to get enough calories in. So, uh, quite different builds. Yeah, we so, are. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's I a tend good point. to, I, yeah, I can put on weight quite easily. Yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I got tested, uh, had the genetic testing and <laughs> once and the FTO or what I call the fat gene did come up and I, my friend, uh, who's a high performance director at a couple of the teams I was at, he, he laughed. He's like, I always knew you're a fatty. <laughs> so, it was good. <laughs> did you used to be a bit bigger or? <clears throat> Uh, when I played rugby, I was sort of around 92, 93 kilos, but I was a scrum half. Yep. So I was big for a scrum half. Um, but yeah, probably my ideal weight's probably about 82. Yeah, 10 so, kilos lighter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's weird when you, I don't know, if I lift a lot of weights or something like that, then I tend to get big. If mm. I sort of do cardio, which I hate, I tend to <laughs> lose it. So. Well, that's, uh, doesn't, it, <clears throat> as long as you know what you're doing, right? That's, that helps a lot. <clears throat> and uh so you've been traveling and you just kind of settled back into Sydney now. You're, you're looking for a, a new place to stay? Yeah, if anyone's got a house yeah. <laughs> or a flat. Um, Challenging time of year to be looking, isn't it? Or Yeah, it's tough. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm currently house sitting for a mate in Manly and that's really good. I haven't mm. actually lived in Australia for 18 years. So it's oh, that um, long. Yeah, it's been a bit of a journey uh, around the world, living and working in various countries and for various teams and places. And uh mm coming back now uh for a number of reasons um yeah. you know it's a it's a process yeah well you haven't you you have ended up in a very nice <coughs> spot in manly i used to live there as well it's beautiful there yeah i i think i said uh to myself if i'm moving back to australia i'm gonna live near the beach because uh England and uh, Boston and Toronto certainly uh, I didn't get much beach time. <laughs> yeah, made you miss the beach a little bit. Yeah. So how did you first get your interest into nutrition? Was that something that you always wanted to do from you know your teens, or or did that just kind of fall into your lap, or how was that journey for you? Um, probably. So I initially studied physiotherapy at University of Sydney, and. Oddly enough, we don't learn anything about nutrition, which now when I look back at it, I think it's it's actually a major flaw in the degree and something that should be sort of, I don't know now. I mean, I did physiotherapy nearly, what, 20 odd years ago. Yeah. So I wonder if they do some basics now. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, what I did see was the link between nutrition and then injury and rehabilitation, especially when you work in professional sports where teams have access to nutritionists and dietitians and 
mm. you see the accelerated rehab process and you start wondering why. And I think nutrition plays a huge role in that. <clears throat> um, so then I, I was living in London and I was lucky enough to get accepted on the master's uh, sports medicine master's at Queen Mary University of London. And um, a couple of the modules there were nutrition and performance nutrition and it sort of sparked my interest. I started reading a bit more and then oddly enough, um, the, the four hour body, the book. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> the Tim Ferriss book. Tim Ferriss. I, uh, I started reading that and it was like, I mean, it's pretty out there and there's a, you know, there's some questionable science in there at best, <laughs> I would say. But I think what is really cool about Tim is that he, you know, he, he's hacking and he's trying stuff and, you know, just cause there isn't evidence doesn't mean there's evidence of, you know, or lack of evidence, uh, for efficacy of, um, something that works. And so, you know, he, he has some pretty out there sort of things. And I did some of his, like, you know, the, what is it? The low carb, slow carb diet and all yep. that. And it just got me interested and I saw things change and reacted differently to different foods. And from there I, um, I spoke to a guy, uh, Professor Laurent Bannock, and he was associated with the International Society of Sports Nutrition, um, the ISSN, and um, with, uh, oh, what's Jose's name? God, it'll come to me. Um, and they were setting up a postgraduate diploma, and he said, would you like to join it? And I was, yeah, I was like, this would be great. And we had, uh, I mean, we had so many amazing lecturers, James Morton, uh, Kevin Tipton, um, oh, so many just internationally recognized um, professors come and lecture us. And mm. it, it was amazing, amazing, um, you know, year of study and growth in that sort of field. So it was really cool. Are there any lectures that you <clears throat> still remember? Because from my uni days, there's a couple that stands out and I'll probably never forget them because of the lecture and the topic that they went through. <clears throat> Is there anything that stands out for you that were like eye-opening or, or anything that just made so much sense to you at the time? Yeah, I think um, actually one in particular, Lee Breen, Professor or Dr. Lee Breen, he, he talked a lot about sarcopenia. Um, sarcopenia that? is progressive loss of muscle as we age. So sarco being muscle and penia being loss of. So think of osteopenia, which you hear a lot of and osteoporosis. Mm. We don't tend to hear a lot about sarcopenia. Um, and pretty much as we age, pretty much from the age of 28, um, we start to lose muscle mass and lose muscle fibers. So it's not just, um, reduction in size, it's actually reduction of fibers. Um, and once that starts to occur, then it's very difficult to get it back. Um, so hyperplasia, which is, you know, actual growth of muscle fibers versus hypertrophy, which is uh, the actual size of the fibers changing. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, sarcopenia is an aging. And if you look at like society today, we're getting older. And unfortunately, you then have uh, sarco sarcopenic obesity, which is fat people losing muscle, which becomes a major health issue. And <clears throat> I think Lee's lecture on that and sort of the influence the protein can have on the aging population and how you can still stimulate muscle hypertrophy in an older population when it's augmented with like a, a really good resistance training program and it just got me really interested in that side of things that you can actually still make a difference with mm. you know and the elderly i think as a definition now is over 50 which uh, i'm fast approaching we're getting there yeah i'm fast <laughs> approaching which is quite sad but yeah um <clears throat> So I really took that on board and actually I had my N equals one, which was my dad and, you know, dad's 75 and I got him lifting weights and got him on a high protein diet, put him on creatine, put him on everything. And, awesome. uh, you know, he, he dropped seven centimeters off his, you know, he's always been fit, but mm. like, you know, he dropped seven centimeters off his, uh, midriff and, uh, he just got strong. He can do chin ups. He's 75. That's he can do awesome. sort of three sets of 10 and. Wow. That was cool. And, yeah. you know, it's, I mean, he, he's backed off a bit and he, he realized he needs to get back into it because we went hiking in um, Alberta and British Columbia last year. And, <clears throat> you know, we, we punched out probably close to 120 Ks of hiking in uh, 10 days. And, yeah, which is pretty good for an old fella. And, um, you know, but he, he realized how weak his legs were, like what he thought was weak comparatively. Yeah. And he's like, shit, I need to get back into the gym. So, yeah, wow. Which is cool. So, you know, and it, I think when I've written a few articles on sarcopenia and aging and 
it's really good when people read it and they go, wow, this is my mum or this is my dad. And mm. Or it'll be me soon. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully <point>. not. <laughs> hopefully, uh, I mean, we're both yeah. fairly fit individuals and we like lifting weights and exercising. <laughs> so I think the real thing is you can turn it around. Yeah. Like if you are older and you haven't done anything, you can still make a difference. And I think that's really powerful. So Yeah, that's a good point because, uh, yeah. I'm freaking out straight away thinking about myself. They're getting older and I, I want to avoid this psychopenia. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> well, you're about 21. Come on. <laughs> but what you're saying is as well, you know, if we look at our parents or someone that is a bit older and even if they haven't trained a lot with the right training, weight training by the sounds of it and protein intake, they can still <clears> rebuild it, right? And massive, massive mm. impact on it. And it's never too late. And, you know, the, the sooner you get on it, the better. And mm. I think the misconception is that lifting weights is only for young people. And, you know, when you look at the research, like older people have just as good gains, you know, mm. relatively speaking, as younger people, as long as they lift to an intensity that is applicable to, you know, to them, you know, mm. in that eight, eight to 10 rep sort of, you know, RM range and push them hard, have adequate rest, mm. adequate stimulus then you can still create you know meaningful change and you couple that with a good diet which as i said is probably higher protein because older people require actually more protein than younger people okay to stimulate muscle protein synthesis which yep. is which i found fascinating it goes back to the lecture yeah so um, almost supplementing for older people is <clears throat> could be even more important than for younger people massively okay yeah. and i think it's it's an area which is really poorly recognized like my grandma is in a nursing home and she's 92 and you know i just look at what she eats and it's like it's mm. just so heavily carbohydrate mm. uh focused and when you look at what they're doing it's very minimal <laughs> in terms of sitting down and their protein intake is very low and i don't know it, it just really bugs me so you know yeah uh, i love seeing some of the gyms around here <laughs> that i work with that have their own program for an older population, like you're saying, 50 plus, like at the, at B athletic, they have the vitality plan and they have about 10 to 12 guys and, and guys and girls from male and females over 50 that, you know, do a program at a suitable pace for them and lift lighter weights, but they still come in there, you know, two, three <coughs> times a week and do that. But that's such a good point that, I mean, for them, it would be important to monitor their protein intake with that. So. Yeah, my point being, like, it's mm. awesome that B Athletics doing that, and I think that's something that all gyms should aspire to do is encourage the older population to get in there. And it's, a, you know, it's a tricky one because old people don't always want to be seen as old people. Yeah, and my dad hates <laughs> being called old, and you know, you look at him and he doesn't I understand look, that. Yeah, and same with my mum. Like she, you know, she's mm. seventy, but she doesn't look seventy, and she doesn't act seventy. And so there is that fine line. But I think if you can offer something that at least caters for the intense, like they've still got to work and train intensely mm. to get that stimulus. But I don't think it has to be like, you know, there, there's differences. Yeah, it, between like a 25 year old person trying to compete in CrossFit, right? It's not, it'd be it's, hard it, to keep them in the same class. Yeah, it's context and relative. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like if they're lifting weights, but their diet is inadequate, mm. then potentially they could be going into a state of catabolism as opposed to a state of, uh, and as opposed to an anabolic state. Mm. And that may be not so good for them. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really, really pushing that protein up sort of, you know, as long as they don't have any renal issues, then, you know, 2.2 up to 3 grams per kilo body weight is yep. definitely what I would be recommending for an older person. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> let's say a 70 or let's say 80 kilo male should have about 160 grams or more, ideally. Probably almost more, closer to 200. Yeah, I mean... 80 kilo person's what 175 pounds so whatever you weigh in pounds is roughly 2.2 mm. grams per kilo body weight it's yep. a really easy way of thinking about it whatever you weigh in pounds is what you should consume in protein it's the only time the imperial system has made sense absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah but then if you take it back to fat intake roughly you know again if you really want rough recommendations i'd say mm. whatever you weigh in kilos is what you should eat in fat yeah because that's one gram per kilo body weight. So then, it's you know, the way. metric system yeah. comes back on it. And then you just got to calculate your carbs out of that, depending on what your, uh, you know, your sort of energy intake is calculated at. Which, yeah. yeah. Well, th this is a great topic <clears throat> that's relevant to everyone, I believe, especially right now at the beginning of the year, where 
at the tail end of January 2020. By the way, where did, did that month go? Yeah. <laughs> went quick. It's just flying by. And so many people are looking at, you know, the beginning of the year as an opportunity to make some changes with their nutrition, get into a healthier habit, hopefully <clears throat> get some training done. And even February as well as a month, it's often a month that we're at the gym, we're trying to do a, encourage a campaign where, you know, no alcohol for February. February, February is the best month. You've only got three weekends. Yeah. And Perfect. people, and people come off, <laughs> you know, a big, month year. big month, um, or big holiday. Yeah. So the most common, oh, there's so <laughs> many questions that we get around nutrition and how to get started, but what would you say is some of the key things to think about when you're looking to make a change for the better in your diet? And I know that's a super broad question, but things to consider are, for instance, you know, their body type, their goal, um, their current training habit or diet. But if you was, was going to give a broad general answer or some key things to get started, <laughs> what would that be? Um, so... My, my big thing with clients is try and create baselines. I think that's first and foremost the most important thing. So when I work with clients online um, or in person, it's about establishing baselines. And you can do that a number of ways. Firstly, I would always recommend a DEXA scan, um, one that provides an accurate measure of your body composition. So DEXA stands for dual X-ray absorbometry. Um, and it will give you a measure of your subcutan subcutaneous fat, but also your visceral fat, so the fat around your organs. It will give you what's called an android gynoid ratio, which is the um, your midsection relative to your weight, uh, your waist relative to your hips, which is a very good measure for metabolic disease, type two diabetes, so on. Um, I think if you can't get that then you could go down the route of bioelectrical impedance, which is standing on one of those machines, holding, yeah, depending on the type of machine. Um, some of the new in-body ones are really good, in-body three or in-body mm. four. The main thing with that is make sure your hydration status is standardized and you are well hydrated. Do you mean relative to when you go <clears throat> on there and measure yourself, it should be the same hydration level next time you go on? Ideally, yeah, okay. because if you're not hydrated, you're gonna get a higher reading of fat because muscle is roughly 70% water. Yeah, oh, and you don't have that issue if you do a DEXA scan. There is some issues with hydration status with DEXA, but it's still a bit, it's more accurate than, say, biological impedance. It's sort of, yeah. you know, underwater weighing is your gold standard, but, you know, yeah. good, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's make it easy for people Make as well. it easy. Yeah. So I think, first and foremost, I'd get that. And the other advantage, especially if you're a female, is that the DEXA will do a bone mineral density as well. And I think if, mm. you know, if you're... Th you know, if you've had issues as a female, either with some eating issues or if you're over 40, then I think getting a BMD done is really useful. I mean, I've had, I can think of four recent clients who have all come back nearly osteopenic and they're 38. What does that mean? Uh, again, osteo bone, penic, mm -hmm. progressive loss off. So osteopenia is the next stage is osteoporosis. Yeah. So they're losing bone strength. Well, they've lost density. No, bone density. density so... Yeah. This could be, uh, I mean, probably related to some eating Diet, yep. stuff, um, may maybe disordered eating as a teenager when your bone is being laid down <clears throat> um, and then diet through. So, you know, calcium intake, vitamin D status, things like that. And what are some of the things that will help then, your bone density? So lifting weights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them have never lifted weights before. Yeah. And, you know, you see these... You know, and talking specifically about females here, but you know, some of them who come back with body fat percentages of close to thirty percent, and you look at them and you're like, "That's not possible," mm. but they are, and they just don't have any muscle on them. And yeah. you know, if I think of uh, if I think of females, like most of them say, like when you go through goals, what do you want? They're like, "I want to be toned. I want to be slender." And it's like, "Well, you got to lift some weights." And they're like, "But I don't want to turn into some CrossFit chick." And it's like. <laughs> You're not going to, okay? Like it's, it's very hard work. It's very hard work. <laughs> It'll take you a while. <laughs> the volume and the intensity yeah. and whatnot, you know, that they're doing, it's not going to happen. Mm. You're just going to lose fat and you're going to, you know, look better and you're going to be healthier and your bone mineral density is probably going to improve and a whole heap of health markers are going to improve. So, um, yeah, so back, back to your original question. Yeah, I'd, so I'd, I'd start with that. If you can't do that, um, you know, a lot of people err on the whole thing of weighing. I think weighing is, you know, look, 
the reality is if you want to lose weight, you got to sort of, you know, you've got to measure it. So mm. I usually say twice a week, uh, Monday, Friday, same time in your birthday suit. Um, why, on your, why on the Friday? <clears throat> I don't know. It could be Thursday. <laughs> just, I just you want to have a gap between Monday. Yeah, and, you yep. want to. So you've got. You don't want people. Look, what I'm very big on though is don't look at the scales every mm. day because you're going to have variability based on hydration status. Yeah. I think if you can start to get trends, so Monday, Friday, and then the good thing about weighing in on a Monday is after the weekend you start to get a view of patterns. You know, mm. they weigh in uh, on a Friday and come Monday they're a kilo heavier. You're like. Yep. How was your weekend? Oh, I didn't do anything. Really? Uh, I had a few drinks, right? <laughs> had a few drinks on Friday, Saturday, <laughs> Saturday. Sunday. Add it uh, up, it might be 40 drinks all over the And weekend. And then it's a conversation about what's reality versus perception. Mm. And, you know, I think, so that that's sort of, um, you know, some baselines there. Waist, waist to height measurement is a really good one. So all you need is a bit of string. Um, measure your height out with a mm. bit of string. Fold it in half. If it doesn't go around the narrowest part of your weight, you've got an issue. A oh, waist, wow. you've yeah. got an issue. So it should be 0. 0.5. Okay. So whatever half your height should be around your waist. If that doesn't yeah. fit, then you're at risk of heart disease, metabolic disease, such as type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome. Mm. Um, it's a really simple one. It's one that should be used much more than BMI. Yeah, um, I like that because what most people <clears throat> are saying is that they want to lose weight. But what they really mean is that they want to look better naked. Correct. The number on the scale, no one ever sees the number on the scale, really, unless you're showing people. Yeah. But it's the way they look in their clothes, that's what they want to improve. <laughs> and like you said, at some point, a lot of these people are going to have to lift at least a little bit of weight to build some muscle and tone. And that's actually going to gain a little bit of weight on the scale, right? Relative, depending it on will, the person. And, <clears throat> you know, if you're going to pack on a heap of muscle, then, you know, you might put on a little bit of weight. The reality is, is most people, and they say... Yeah, they do, you know, the weight will come off as the fat drops off, mm. um, you know, and it's, it's a balance between losing, f if you lose weight or mass very quickly, the reality is you're probably losing fat mass and muscle mass. So, you know, half a kilo to one kilo max per week is probably ideal. Um, and it's sustainable. Yeah. You can do that. And you know, there's pros and cons of losing weight quickly. If you lose some weight quickly, it creates buy-in um, and enthusiasm. Oh, and, yep. um, you know, they, they get encouraged. If they're not, if they lose 200 grams by the end of a week and they feel like they've been really restrictive with their diet, then they might give up. They might give up. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I think, yeah, that's, they're probably a few of the measures I'd give. Photos are really useful, not necessarily to put on Instagram or anything <laughs> like that. Like the whole transformation thing it's sort of i don't know it, it's good and it's bad like i i get it that people want to show that they've changed i just there's so much manipulation with those photos yeah. like lighting and sticking your stomach out and yeah all that i think really like if you can show measurable change through weight through girth measurements through dexa scans and actually present that to a client mm. then it's meaningful you know and it, again, it comes down to reality versus perception because, you know, you show someone their DEXA and they're like, wow, I'm 30% body fat. Mm. You know, it, it suddenly hits hits home. Like, yeah. you know, an example, like a good friend of mine, he's in a wheelchair actually. Uh, he broke his neck about 10, 12 years ago. And we were just chatting about diet and stuff. And he's like, I've got to sort this out. Like, and, you know, he's in a wheelchair and he went and got a, he went and got a DEXA scan. Oh, wow. And really cool. Like, and, uh, you know, he's come back and he said, I'm 30% body fat. We've got to sort this out. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a it's, slap in the face, <clears throat> right? And he gets them I think started. so. And, like, it's like, okay, well, where am I going? And if you don't do anything about it, it's going to get worse. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's, it's a really good way of establishing, you know, just where you're actually at as opposed to saying, oh, okay, I'm going to do a diet. Yeah. And I'm going to stay with it. And then two weeks later, you're like, oh, I can't be bothered. Yeah. So step number one, establish a baseline. Yep. Which uh, there's a couple of different ways that we just went through to do that. Oh, the other baseline I recommend is a food diary. Yes. Good so point. You, have yep. to, you have to do a food diary. Yep. I think MyFitnessPal is fantastic. It's free. Mm. Um, I think tracking your food is absolutely essential. And I don't care what anyone says. Everyone's like, I don't want to do it. Well, then you mm. don't really want to do what you want saying you yeah. want to do. Why do you feel like that is important to track what you eat? 
kind of obvious question. <clears> but. <laughs> I think I think there's a number of reasons. Um, I think reality, and I mean th one of the issues with Do you mean people don't know what they eat. Yeah, a lot of that. Like they think like eating a bag of almonds is good for them, and whilst it <laughs> might be somewhat good for them, they suddenly realize, wow, it's got like forty grams of fat. <laughs> You know, and I just consume nearly, you know, 360 yeah. calories or whatever it is. And yep. uh, I think that's the first thing. It educates them on like foods. Like, you know, you have your morning smoothie. It's got half a bag of almonds. It's got an avocado. It's got two tablespoons of coconut oil. It's got my almond milk. It's got chia seeds. It's got flaxseed. It's mm. got a handful of kale. And they blitz it up and they drink it. And they're like, wow, I'm so healthy. And you're like, <laughs> that's a thousand calories. <laughs> and they're like, what? <clears throat> Yeah. And it, it's suddenly like, wow, you just had mm. two thirds of your calories in a shake that you're probably going to be hungry from in an hour's hour time. And, a half, yeah. and yeah. so like, you know, and that's a whole different conversation about matrix of food and breaking it down into smoothies and juices and things. But yeah. Um, so I think food diaries are really good. Um, one of the problems obviously with food diaries is that it depends on the user and whether they're willing to actually acknowledge what they ate. You know, I didn't eat the cookie. I didn't have the Mars bar. And yeah, you got to be honest with it. You got to be course. very honest. And and then again, like whenever I see, I remember a, a, actually the other lecture that really stood out. I think it was um, who was it? It might have been James Morton actually, who works with Liverpool Football Club and Team Sky, the cycling team. He's amazing. Like he's so good with a lot of his research has influenced the way I work with triathletes um, and endurance athletes in terms of carbohydrate periodization period periodization um <clears throat> but uh he he said i think i'm pretty sure it was him and he's like okay we've got a you know we've got a 34 year old female um you know she she tells you she just can't lose weight um you know she she tracks her macro she eats a good diet she lifts weight she does cardio she trains five six times a week she's active you know she's on point she meditates she does everything and she just can't lose weight like you know, what, what's going, going on? on and everyone's like, oh, you know, it's reverse dieting. It's, you know, uh, metabolic, uh, you know, what was it? Metabolic insufficiency or some other keywords, <laughs> pseudoscience words getting thrown out there. Um, you know, this and that. And then he's like, mm-hmm. And we're all sitting there, I was sort of sitting there going, I don't think it's any of that. And then he this goes, This is a trick. <laughs> and yeah, I was like, This is a trick. And then he goes, He goes, No, you're all wrong. And he's like, Everyone's like, What is it? What is it? And he's like, Liar. Yeah. And it comes down to it. You know, if you, if you actually go through it and you do everything you say you're doing, mm. you get results. Yeah. You know, if you, if you eat well, you train well, you live a good lifestyle, yeah. you get results. Like, I mean, as I said, I've been traveling for eight months and like I looked out of condition, actually someone, an ex commented on a photo on Instagram going, geez, dad bod. <laughs> I was like, Jesus. <clears throat> I thought it was a bit rough. Wait, do you let uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, geez. So anyway, you know, yeah. since being back in Australia, I've got back in the gym and yeah, yeah noticeable difference. I've sorted my diet out. Not that I like the word diet. I sorted out my what nutrition and my food and cut back on drinking, started training five, six times a week. Yeah. Suddenly, wow, I look better. <laughs> <It's> all, <laughs> it's, it's happening. Yeah. You're back in a normal routine now, right? Back in yeah. routine. And you know, you think about traveling, you think, oh, I'm probably going to be so healthy and lose heaps of weight and come three o'clock, you're having afternoon beers and uh, yeah. eating pretty ordinary food. And it's about enjoying yourself. It, it when is. you go on a holiday, you almost should add a little bit of weight. <laughs> I think hundred percent. Yeah. And, and no one be too strict. I think, you know, on that point, it's like, life's about living mm. and i'm not i don't like the idea of prepping food and things like that i've never recommended that to clients i think certain cases endurance events and things like that obviously you have to prep but like yeah the idea of putting chicken breast and brown rice and broccoli into containers for six days and <laughs> calling that food i'm like mm, yeah. not really i think it's um you know educating yourself on what food is and getting better at that so yeah, we sort of diverged from your original question, so no, we'll go back. No, it's still it's still part of it. It's good. We established the baseline, and then we've given some advice on tracking your food, or at least be aware of what you're eating and not lying to yourself. Yeah, and then I guess next we can go to <clears throat> what are the common mistakes with the general public that they do <clears throat> with their food, because some people might tick those boxes already. They, you know, 
they have a baseline, they know the goal. It could be losing weight or, I mean, for some people it could be gaining muscle, but let's let's focus on losing weight. And then they track their food and are fairly aware of what they're eating. What are some of the things they need to look out for within their food diary that could be, let's call it red markers or red flags that they're doing mistakes there generally? Yeah, I think, well, the easiest way to think about a food diary as well and um, it's just, you know, you look at the total calories that you've taken in across the week. If the scale on Monday hasn't shifted from the scale on Friday, then probably the total calories you've eaten in the week, if you've been truthful with it, are too much. Mm. If they've stayed roughly the same, you know you're probably in a isocaloric sort of state. And if it's going down, you're probably on target with the amount of calories you're doing. So I think that's like, forget all the fads, forget all the diets. I mean, pretty much like you have, it comes down to calories in, calories out. Like, and mm. you can discuss this till you're blue in the face with people and they'll say, no, it's not and there's differences and it's like well no there's not it it's an energy balance yep. like it does come down to an energy balance you can manipulate that balance um and you can have <clears throat> no you can't have better i know what you're saying but what people might be thinking now is oh but some calories are better than others you can have a <clears throat> eat healthier food or worse food but the calories are still calories can be the, the same, same right yeah yeah i mean yeah. you i remember hearing about um what was it the super size me Yes, uh, with yeah. McDonald's, and obviously he was in a massive calorie surplus of yeah. very unhealthy food. And, <laughs> he ate you know, a lot. His liver exploded and whatnot. <laughs> and he was very unhealthy. Yeah, but then I did hear about another doctor who did a McDonald's soup, like um, mini mini size meal or something like mm. that, and he ate uh, a diet which was in a calorie deficit purely of McDonald's and lost weight. Mm. Now again, losing weight doesn't necessarily confer being healthy. healthy. And that's a good point for listeners to sort of get on top of is just because you lose weight doesn't mean you're healthy. Like, I mean, the nutrient status of that food was probably appalling. Yet what it proved was it doesn't matter what food you eat, if you're in a deficit, you can still lose weight. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so I think then you go like, okay, what are the mistakes you look at? Look at the quality of the food that you're eating. Start going through, You can, if you use the, like I usually recommend pay for the pro version of M, um, MyFitnessPal initially, because what it does is rank the foods that are highest in protein, carbohydrates, sugar, fiber, fat, so on, and you can look at the list. And I say, go through the top 10, mm. have a look at them and see which foods there have barcodes. Okay. And so like, if you look at your carbohydrates and look at that and go, wow, I ate, you know, bagels, White bread, pasta, um, I don't know. Burgers, pizza. Twinkies, pizza, <laughs> burgers. And that's all in your top 10. Then you start looking at the quality of the food you're consuming. Whereas if like everything in your top 10 carbohydrates pretty much came from the ground. Mm. So you had, you know, uh, baby spinach, you had some rocket, you had kale, you had collards, you had carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, I don't know what else comes from the ground, <laughs> whatever else, <clears throat> tomatoes, celery, cucumbers, and that's your top 10. Okay. You're, you're starting to win because mm. the density and the quality of those foods is going to be so much better. Mm. Um, you know, the, the density of calories a is a lot lower. You're not going to get half as many carbohydrates per gram, uh, per kilo of food versus, you know, processed carbohydrates, which are going to give you a lot of carbohydrates in a small amount of food. Mm. So you're probably going to feel a lot fuller whilst getting better quality nutrition um, at the same time. Same with, you know, do that with all the top 10 foods that you eat. Same with your proteins. Where's your protein coming from? Is it is it good quality protein? Is it lean sources of protein? Is it, you know, white fish? Is there some oily fish? Are there small oily fish? How many times are you eating red meat? I don't have a problem with red meat. I think... Mm. Red meat can be eaten, you know, a couple of times a week, maybe more if you're a female and you, um, you know, you have an iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, things like that. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, looking looking at the quality of your food is probably one thing I would say that is a common mistake with people. You can be, you know, if you're a vegetarian, you're a vegan, you can still be very, very unhealthy. I mean, you can yep. eat bread, you can eat pasta, you can eat you know, all the things that are, you know, not necessarily healthy yet still vegetarian or vegan. So. Yeah. I did that for five yeah. years. What's that? Vegetarian? Uh, yeah. I was vegetarian for five years and I basically just toast. <laughs> 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 it's not healthy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I want to, well, they, they're great points. I wanted to ask another question because I think a lot of uh, listeners, they understand, they have a better understanding now of, of the macros, like protein, yep. carbs, and fats. But one thing that I've seen more and more discussed lately is <clears throat> fiber. Can you explain just the basics of fiber? Why is that important? Why is it relevant for us? And what should people be looking at? Where are we getting our fibers from? Yeah, so fiber fiber is insoluble or soluble, um, and it comes from carbohydrates, um, mainly plant-based um, sources. And what it, what it's really important for is is the gut, okay, and the gut health. Um, so you have it affects your poo. <clears throat> <laughs> it, it can affect your poo, but high fat diets can affect your poo too, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, effectively, your your gut's microbiome, the bacteria in your gut, feeds on uh, what are called prebiotics. And there's certain prebiotics, things like chicory root, garlic, onion, that are better than others. Um, and effectively, that's what helps your populations flourish or diminish if you're consuming those prebiotics and those types of fibers. So it becomes incredibly important from a health perspective. And if you look at more and more of the research related to the gut brain access, then a healthy gut probably relates to a healthy brain. Smarter brain. <laughs> yeah, maybe not smarter, <laughs> but certainly healthier. And, um, you know, definition of health is always an interesting one. But um, I actually worked at a gut health biotech startup in, when I was in Boston. So it was really cool learning a lot about this. And um, a really good book to read is the the gut mind connection by Emron Mayer. Um, he's a gastroenterologist at UCLA, um, and he describes it as like a sort of four way highway going up and a two lane highway coming down. So it's actually from the gut up to the brain, as opposed to the brain down to the gut in terms of the way things are controlled in your body. Mm. <clears throat> um, the gut microbiome feeds on these prebiotics and this fiber and that's what creates short chain fatty acids short chain fatty acids are then the fuel that effectively allow for so many physiological processes to occur in the body mm. uh, if you don't have that then the metabolites so they're the things that flow around the the body um, and cross over some of them cross over the blood brain barrier if you don't have those particular metabolites and they're not in particular balance then a myriad of sort of disease states seem to be correlated to those and a lot of it is correlation and correlation is not causation i get that but i think as you start to see more and more correlation you can start to say okay mm. maybe this is right so it is amazing to think of that something like eating enough fibers and getting it through generally through plant-based sources can have an effect on your brain right that's yeah, kind crazy. of what we're saying which sounds ludicrous i mean if i try to explain that to my dad i think he'd be like it's he like, would, it's yeah, like he this just almost wouldn't believe it but. it's like this notion of uh your gut has memories mm. so the whole and it's so hard to explain but like that gut feeling you have is based on experiences you had through life and the bacteria creates these memories that then go up to the brain yeah. And it, it's so <laughs> weird to think about. And yeah. it, it's so... It's I mean, amazing to think about. Emran, Emran uh, Dr. Mayer, he explains it really well in the book and it's mm. really worth reading. I had to read it probably two or three times to sort of get my head around it. But <laughs> it, it's so cool. And that gut feeling you get is yeah. based on experience. Yeah. It's not just this weird thing. It's actually based on something that has occurred to you in the past. And those memories are created from the bacteria in your gut that are going to your brain. And that's why your gut feeling is something you should trust. And it's Amazing. so cool. Yeah. Like, I mean, the more you read about, like, I think there's a lot of fluff. There still is a bit of fluff it's out there. It's very difficult to prove <clears throat> anything of that, I guess. A lot of it's theoretical yeah. frameworks. And um, I worked, I was lucky enough to work with a mother and daughter combination of Wayne Matson and Sam Matson. And Wayne literally is like the godfather of metabolomics. And, uh, you know, he's just this old dude you can talk about anything and you know he's worked with nasa he's worked with i don't know every mayo <laughs> and all this and he he just sit and just absolutely blow you away with discussions of you know how the keg pathway works and the metabolites here and that and you're just like wow, wow. yeah it's yeah. so cool 
That's awesome. Okay, to round off this topic of, <clears throat> around nutrition advice, I guess is what we can call it for the general pop. Uh, we've given some good pointers to get started. Now, how can people maintain this throughout the year and not just for an eight-week challenge? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. Um, so if I, if I, what are some things that's yeah. helped your clients, for instance? So I, oh God, I'm giving all my secrets away. <laughs> <laughs> you could just do broad strokes. No, no. <laughs> I think um, probably the most powerful thing is what's called a why. It's a click through exercise, and um, a click through um, is where you ask yourself the same question over and over again until you get to the real reason. So the question of why do you want to do this, and people always go, "Oh, I want a six pack," and they're mm. like, "Why?" And they're like, because it makes me feel better. And it's like, why? Because I'm healthier. Why? Why is being healthier important? Oh, because, you know, it allows me to, like, be around my family. Why is that important? Because I have a young kid and a wife. Why is that important? Because I love them. Mm. And then you're like, bingo. Yeah. That's what you've got to come back to. Yeah. And it's why are you doing this? It's because you love your family, you love your kids, and you want to be around them for a long time. Mm. And if you can go back to that intrinsic reason as opposed to the extrinsic, I want a six pack, which is never going to drive you. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that motivation will last for a week, maybe. <laughs> if that, <laughs> my God. And like doing yeah. abs, if that's what you want to do to get a six pack, then yeah. Yeah, it's the worst thing in the world. But, yeah. uh, you know, that extrinsic reasoning is never going to drive you. Whereas, you know, that real intrinsic driver, and it, it may not be a wife or kids because you may not have them, mm. um, but just find that intrinsic reason and then come back to it, write it down, stick mm. it on your fridge, stick it on your mirror, whatever it is. And so you see that every day and you go, oh, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. And you can slip that's up awesome. and you can slip up. Like I, you know, I say like have a Friday blowout, have yeah. a Saturday blowout, whatever it is, just don't have five blowouts. Mm. And if, you know, again, go back to Tim Ferriss, you know, the 80-20 rule. If you're good 80% of the time and not so good 20% of the time, and if you do damage limitation in that 20% as well and you're mindful and aware of what you're doing in that 20%, then you're going to come out better. And I think one something that I see is that when people don't have that why, they don't have that purpose, when they miss out on a day or when they screw up on a day, then it's so hard for them to come back into the good routine again. But if they have that purpose and they're reminded of it, it's so much easier just to get back on track again. So much easier. Yeah. So much easier. And it, 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 it's so powerful. And like I've had grown men cry, like, mm. like Skyping or whatever, <laughs> where I'm like, why? And yeah. they're like, stop asking why. And I'm like, but why? And they just hey, I love my family. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, it's cool when you get that emotion out yeah. and you're like, oh, shite. Yeah. That's why. And then it's like, okay, cool. Now we got it. And whenever they slip yeah. up, it's like, hey, remember. think of the why. Remember the why. Yeah. That's, it's <clears> part of being a trainer and someone that helps people is, is also to be, you know, a bit of a, um, uh, what, what can you call it? Like, a th I guess, a therapist in some ways. You're a coach. Mm. Yeah. And look, you can, look you can have all the science in the world behind you. And I can talk about grams this, grams that. Yeah. and. Uh, you know, max fat oxidation, like whatever you want to talk about. But if you can't translate it into real world and practical scenarios, then it's a waste yeah. of time. And unfortunately, some people don't want to hear the real world and the practical elements of it. They want, they, they think they want to hear all the technical science mumbo jumbo. And I probably see that more in professional sports, to be fair. Oh, really? Yeah. Where, they, you know, they think they know it all and you talk to them about the basics yeah. and yeah, but it's not the latest and greatest, so it's not that interesting. And yeah, I think if um, you know, you've you've got to be able to relate to them. And I actually, you know, had someone a female recently, and she's like, "I just want you to kick my ass, you know, <laughs> and keep me on track." And it's yeah. like that's pretty much what people need. And yeah. <clears throat> we were talking before we went on air about books and things, and uh, we're talking about culture code and. Part of it is um, the very first chapter is about belonging and feeling safe. And that's what creates uh, productivity. And I think it, it really resonates with me as well. Like when I think of if people feel safe in an environment talking about nutrition and health and fitness and that, uh, you know, you think about the successful, like think of CrossFit. Mm. 
people love it because they feel safe in that environment and they feel they're part of a community in that and mm. whatever gym you're at f45 for instance mm. you know people you hear this you hear these words like family and like they're my brothers they're my sisters whatever and I think same thing in what if you've got a nutrition business or a fitness business or whatever, it's like trying to include them as your family mm. and actually thinking about them and caring about them. And that gets hard when things scale. Um, and I think that's the challenge of it. But I think if you can have that real human factor and feel like, you know, checking in on them, seeing how they're going, oh, I slipped up. That's all right. Mm. You know, we're back at it. And, you know, it's it's the constant encouragement. It's not just the, you know, again, think of the eight week challenges it's like yeah you're in and then bang that's it and yeah. then eight weeks later how'd you go uh, or maybe it is and maybe that's why people do really well with the eight week challenges because it is constant reinforcement for the eight weeks and they're in an environment where everyone does it yeah and then after the eight weeks bang it's gone mm. and suddenly why do they all slip off and yeah because it so maybe maybe the real challenges should be actually fifty two week challenges and eight year challenge. Yeah, I mean, why not? So yeah, yeah. I think that's a good uh, way to round out that topic. Another thing I wanted to talk to you more about is the athletes and the teams that you have been working with, and there <clears> are, are several. Um, so, what are some of the challenges that you see when you work with athletes and how they have to you know perform at their peak? Uh, you can maybe pick someone, like, like, let's say, for instance, the Oracle team in sailing. Like, what are some of the really tough jobs that you've had there <laughs> to make sure that the athletes there are at their at their peak performance? Um, yeah, I think it, it's a good question. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Team USA Oracle um, and live in Bermuda for two and a half years, which was terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think so, you mean that as a joke. Yeah, as a joke. <laughs> uh, amazing. It's really interesting when you think of sailing, and I think a lot of people think of sailing like you know lying on a deck and having a beer and having a good time. And when you look at these guys, and <clears throat> you know you've got Jimmy Spittle, Tom Slingsby, Carl Langford, um, Sam Newton. You know these some of the best Australian sailors that we've got, and um, you know they're performing now. A lot of those guys I mentioned are in the Sail GP, <clears throat> and these guys are like high intensity athletes like you know you we when we did fitness testing you know they have average heart rates of uh you know if we did a 20 minute time trial you know the heart rates are up sort of 170 plus beats for the entire time max heart rates 20 think, minutes yeah i think matt a guy called matt cassie american sailor he had a max heart rate of 213 i think beats <laughs> cooper dresler same thing like these guys are animals like you know deadlifting for 435 440 yeah, it's about um, 200 kilos, yeah. Yeah, 200 kilo deadlift, yeah. which, you know, I, some people might say, oh, it's not that strong. I think it's pretty strong. No, nah, that's strong. <laughs> I think it's strong. Uh, bench pressing, you know, 110 kilos, 120 sort of. Mm. And these guys are like, you know. They're not powerless, they're sailors. They're sailors. And, you know, there was a lot of comparisons. I, work, I was lucky enough to work in rugby as well, professional rugby in the UK. And I, I saw a lot of comparisons between their level of fitness and strength to rugby players. Wow. And... You know, they're, they're legitimate athletes. Mm. And I think that's sort of, you know, people don't fully appreciate how mm. good these guys are. And technically, then you throw in the element of sailing. And it's like, wow, these guys are going to contend not just with like wind, but then water and their heart rate going through the roof, trying to make splits, uh, split second decisions, moving at 50 knots mm. uh, per hour, which, I mean, is really quick yeah. like i was i was lucky enough to be on the boat once and like oh wow absolutely hanging on for Were you scared life. oh yeah man <laughs> and they just stick you on the net in between and they're just like just hang on and i'm like oh shit. Uh, wow. great bunch of guys though and yeah. I, I think look for them the biggest challenge i think i mean some of them had weight because like, there's a weight issue on the boat Oh, they can't weigh too much can't, we had an average weight across it but obviously you have guys like the skipper and the wing trimmer, um, and our wing trimmer is like, uh, Kyle Langford was like 6'6", six, 6'5". Six, oh, six, wow. And so he's a big guy, but he had to be mm. close to 80 kilos. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, for him in particular, like we worked a lot together to get his weight down. And yeah, it was mm. tough. It is really tough. And you never stay at that weight. Obviously, it's trying to periodize it and... Oh, so time they, it so, so that they're almost losing it. weight like fighters for an event well yeah unfortunately sometimes wow. i mean they did they did dips big dips in saunas That's and crazy. things which yeah. you know you don't you know there's been a lot of media coverage on the dipping with fighters and things like that and i think there is a bit of difference with obviously these guys aren't getting their heads punched in 
Um, yeah, and I guess fighters they rehydrate and gain weight again for their lot. performance. Well, whereas we the did, sailors, no, we you can do the same thing. It's only for oh. the weigh in, and then they can regain their weight. So oh, it's very similar. Okay, I got I got a bit confused there because I thought they needed to be light when they were sailing to keep the weight down to get the boat faster. But you're saying they they actually it do was a weigh just, in. There is actually a weigh in. Oh yeah, yeah. wow, I did not know that. And then depending on the wind speed, it depends if you want the boat to be heavy or light. And oh wow. So there's all sorts of weird things going on, but it, it was really cool. And yeah. I think the biggest challenge for them was probably just getting to that level of professionalism. And I think when we started, I had um, an amazing high performance director, a guy called Craig McFarlane, who worked at Saracens Rugby. He was lucky enough to be involved in San Francisco when they came back from 8-1. And, you know, it's just that level of professionalism and stepping up from campaign to campaign and the boats change, the technology is amazing, and it's just getting them to this physical peak, um, mm. you know, and two and a half years of preparation wow. for, for, what, a couple of weeks racing and... You know, the races went for 20 minutes, but these guys trained. I mean, they trained five, five, six days a week, you know, an hour and a half, two hours every day yeah. at least minimum, you know, for two and a half years. So motivation is a big thing to keep going. And, you know, we're, we're a tight group, mm. really tight group. And you talk about culture and stuff like that. And it, it was a great, great team energy and great team culture. Yeah, what are some of the things, when you look back on the two and a half years there, what are some of the things that that team did really well? And it doesn't necessarily have to be nutrition related, but as a team culture, I'm really interested in that. What, yeah, what did you guys do well that you look back on and we're like, that's something that we nailed? Yeah, I think, the, I mean, with the team, you had a sailing team and you had a shore crew team. Um, I think within, I'll talk specifically about the sailing team, like we had... Uh, you know, just a really tight knit bunch of guys that hung out a lot. We, you know, we go raft ups, you know, hang out. Uh, a lot of the guys did free diving and stuff like that. And we'd play golf together. We just, it was literally like having, you know, sounds fun. Yeah. It was like literally <laughs> having like 15 brothers and, uh, <laughs> yeah, just really good bunch, bunch of guys. But then as a team, I think, uh, you had guys like Grant Simmer, who's, um, you know, America's cup legend and, he, he was um, in charge of sort of operations and I think he did a great job in bringing the team together and really trying to include everyone. So one thing which was I thought amazing was all the partners, um, girlfriends, wives and that. We actually had two, two or three training sessions every morning, uh, sorry, three times a week where they would train with a boxing coach and, do, and a fitness coach and do uh, sessions to include them and make sure that they were included within the team ethos. Oh, wow. And I thought I'd never heard of that happening before. And I thought that was amazing to include them in that sense. And we did a lot of team barbecues, like evenings, things like that. And just, it was all about family. And yeah. I think we often referred to ourselves as like, you know, the Oracle family and stuff like that. And it, it was just a really special time, I think. Yeah. To, to be so a lot of social that. interactions really between them, right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Even and outside of training. Yep. Outside of training. I think within the training element, I think there was a lot of accountability um you know the the guys held each other accountable for training like no one was ever late for training um everyone put in 100 percent effort and uh you know testing talk about baselines and things like that you know craig, uh, craig the high performance director you know he's very big on you know same thing like having actual programs that were in in blocks it was periodized there were testing blocks there were power blocks hypertrophy blocks strength blocks and you know, it, it's very systematic. It sounds very simple, but it's effective. Yeah, so, and it's know. not everyone that does that. <laughs> no, no. And I think what's it's really funny talking about like professional sport and, you know, you work in professional sport and you realize that they do programs like, you know, for four-week blocks, five-week blocks, they'll do the same thing on a Monday, same thing on a Tuesday for four or five weeks. And it's progressive, like the load changes or the reps change, mm. the volume might change, but they do the same thing. And then they'll switch it up. And I think a lot of people don't get that concept that it's it doesn't always have to be like this mind-blowing. Yeah, you, know, you want to get strong, you squat, you deadlift, you <laughs> lunge, like for your legs. Yeah. If you want to get strong in your upper body, you bench press, you pull, you... Yeah. You know, you do chins. It's like pretty simple. Yeah. 
do the compound lift and the, the, do the big yeah, stuff and just yeah. keep it pretty simple and you, you're going to get results yeah. and you know and do them well i think it's important too that's do, do it's it not really well. don't just go in and do deadlifts if you no. don't know what you're doing that's Definitely that can not. be a short short career as well yeah i see some pretty interesting things yeah i mean in, in, <laughs> the internet is a beautiful place with fail videos so yeah, yeah there's some good instagram <laughs> uh, accounts out yeah there, so. um Another thing I was curious about was your time with the Great Britain rowing team. And yep. from all I know about rowing, my very limited uh, knowledge is that that seems like a sport where lactic acid must just be everywhere. <laughs> I mean, rowing is one of the hardest things that I can do if you do it hard, like for, for time. <laughs> Let's say a 500 meter test or a 1K test, that is just that nothing else will scare me more away from the gym. <laughs> Yeah. Did you do anything around that with nutrition for the rowing team, or and is there any anything you can do? Uh, look, I, I was only involved as a physiotherapist, and I was involved with the women's heavyweight, women's lightweight, and the men's lightweight. Um, and hundred percent, I've never seen athletes train harder in my life. Wow! Like an example would be the women doing a twenty k erg in the morning. Um, just twenty k is just blasted out. <laughs> And then have a little bit of a break, then go out on the water, do another 20 Ks. Then they'd come back in and then do a full on power session, like strength power, like horrendous. Like Three big sessions in the day. It was, it was a training camp in Germany and they were going for it. But wow. I was like, I was blown. I can't remember if I'd were, was that pre, I think it was post working at Leicester Tigers as well. And I was blown away at the intensity at which these girls were training. I've I've never actually I still don't think I've ever seen anyone train harder wow. or with more intensity than these girls. And the crazy thing about rowing is they don't get paid. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, it's a ludicrous. You, you have this sport the where training more with relative to pay. Oh right? my god! And you talk to these girls, and they were like shared homes. They had second jobs, working in bars and things. They couldn't afford to go out. Yet they trained as if their life depended on it. So whatever their why reason was was. Bloody strong. Good. It was really good. Very strong. Um, How I, many I, calories do you think they burn on a day like that, roughly? Oh, God. It, it was so long ago. I mean, the women, the women's heavyweights were pretty big girls too. So I don't know. They're probably up there, maybe five, six, seven thousand calories, yeah. probably. Yeah, something like that. It actually would be fascinating to go back and look at nutrition with those girls yeah. and see what they were eating and doing. I remember there was a lot of uh, a lot of pasta consumed. <laughs> I think, I think I ate a lot of pasta at the time. So it was hard work as a physio. Yeah. Would you recommend pasta these days for an athlete like that if, you, if you're burning through 6,000 calories a day? Oh, yeah. You just got to get calories in mm. um, <clears throat> however you get it. I think, and this is, again, comes down to context, doesn't it? Because, mm. you know, like if I think of, you know, like if, you, if you're burning a hell of a lot of calories, it's just about getting them in. And, you know, it, are we talking health here or are we talking performance? And I know health plays a massive role in performance, yet sometimes, I mean, you just got to get the calories in and calories in might be ice cream. Yeah, you and might. So what you're kind of saying is you might bite the bullet for your health uh, for a short time period for performance yeah. goals. Yeah. I mean, you look at, uh, I was lucky enough to work NHL uh, with the Toronto Maple Leafs and I remember I introduced gummy bears <laughs> and and um snakes at like just to have Always. before games and the guys were like they i think they thought it was like i don't know if you ever seen that, <laughs> that simpsons episode where you know bart's trying to get the cheese and he keeps going for it yeah and they were like they were like is this a test and i'm like no it's like glucose that's what you need yeah. and they're like uh what and they there was this sort of misunderstanding of when glucose or sugar or carbohydrates is really important. And mm. the sport of ice hockey is a purely anaerobic sport. I mean, they are, they are moving yeah. and they're on the ice two to three minutes for a shift. They're off the ice, heart rates up, heart rates down. I mean, you know, yes, there, there's going to be some crossover with fat and carbohydrates, but majority of the time when they're on the ice, it's, it's pure carbs. Yeah. And so getting them fueled up appropriately, like intermission, having gels, having blocks, having, you know, chews, whatever it was, some Gatorade, flat Coke, whatever it was required to get some sugar into them. It's, you know, I, I believe it, it made a huge difference to their performance on the ice. Yeah. I have a pretty good 
experience with that because I I've ran a full marathon once, <laughs> and at the time in the lead up, I was eating very clean. I was that was the year where I tracked my food for the whole twelve months. Yeah, and then when I so when I started running, I had maybe a couple of um, energy gels. bags gels with me, and at every pit stop. At the marathon, they, there's just these people, they're volunteers with a big bucket of jelly beans. Yeah. And all the first stops, I was like, no, nah, no thanks, no thanks, just ran past them. And then I hit 24, 25 Ks and I was just head deep in this bucket. So yeah. I was I was running out of energy quick and I would just do a big handful of them. Yeah. There's that, at a certain point, you just need it. For yeah, sure. I mean, the, the crazy thing I, I find about like endurance athletes is they'll... Um, They'll, they'll, especially if we talk about triathletes, especially you know, we were having this conversation before, but they'll spend so much money on their gear and like, but pay no attention to their nutrition. And then like, they just die. Like yeah. they don't, you've got to practice your nutrition. You've got to understand what you need, you know, based on things like heart rate and, uh, you know, the zones you're, you're pedaling at, the zones you're running at are going to directly you know, your substrate or your, your, the type of energy you're utilizing to fuel you is going to be directly correlated to how hard you're working. And if you don't practice that or you don't understand that, then that's going to have a massive impact on your performance and possibly your health because yeah. you may not finish. <laughs> yeah, you, you told me the other day uh, a point that was really good, especially for something like that. You have to train your stomach and your gut to be able to consume those things. So if you've never had... Uh, energy bar or something while you've been running or on the bike and then you're suddenly going to do it on the on race day your stomach's going to be a little bit upset i think with you massively you see it i mean yeah i mean look some people just unfortunately they they get gastro or gastric yeah. issues on the run but majority of them is when they haven't trained that ability you know if you're talking about a high level uh male you know they can consume 95 grams of carbohydrate combination of glucose and fructose mm. in that hour and effectively get through that now if you try to eat 95 <laughs> grams of sugar and you haven't done that before like it's disastrous and uh, it, it's not nice. probably poo my pants yeah yeah <laughs> well you don't even get to poo them it's liquid <laughs> yeah. it just comes uh, out it just comes out so oh. you know like learning that and and factoring that into your training program is you know, it's tough and, yeah, you know, like I can think of uh, Sarah Pian Piano and I remember we were, we were chatting about it and um, uh, another guy who does podcast, triathlete, Taron, and he, he was commenting about purely ha he's never seen a girl eat more food than Sarah and he was like, I don't get it. Like it's just <laughs> endless. You're always eating. And she's like, but I have to. And yeah. it comes back to like how many calories were the rowers going through? I mean – she goes through a lot of calories as well and you know she trains herself and it, it had a huge impact on her health first mm. and foremost like learning how to eat eat better between uh training sessions and then learning to eat and drink during training sessions and mm. ultimately her health improved and lo and behold her performance improved so yeah you know i think if you're staging like sort of priorities yes health is probably priority number one and do no harm and then from there, like, you know, start looking at evidence-based and research-based sort of, um, you know, recommendations, and then that should hopefully then help performance. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, turn the table a bit more towards yourself and your training and, and what you're doing at the moment. <laughs> I think you're a great example in the sense that you have been traveling, you've been out of your routine and rhythm for a while, which happens to a lot of us, or let's say 2019 was a bad year for some of us, and we're trying to get back into the swing of things now. How are you doing that for yourself with your training and with your nut nutrition? Yep. Uh, <laughs> Putting you on the spot, <clears throat> Scott. So <laughs> I I got back in, what, in December and I just said to myself, right, I've got a, I did a why with myself and I hate doing cardio. And um, like I'm not bad at cardio, I just don't enjoy it that much until I do it and then I finish and then I feel good. It's just that like, <laughs> oh God, I gotta do this, I'm gonna hurt. So I said to myself, why do I wanna do this? And VO2 is really closely linked to longevity. It's one of the, probably the key markers. So if we go back to the baselines as well, another thing I would recommend if you, if you can do it is like a resting metabolic rate, so an RMR. 
with a ga- indirect calorimetry, and then I'd probably say get what's called a fat max test done, either a fat max or a VO2. <clears throat> if you can get both, great. Slight differences in the recommendations of what they come out with. So um, a fat fat max, a is, fat max is test, the same is, like with a mask. Yeah, it's and indirect. Running, you're on a treadmill. Or yeah, something. it's it's a slightly different program or protocol at three minute stages i think they do it in all five minute stages and okay. it just gives you so what's called your um mfo which is your maximum fat oxidation and then it also gives you your fat max so mfo is the grams per minute of fat that you can burn and then your fat max is the percentage of your uh, i want to say this right percentage of your vo2 where you're actually maximally burning so now, you can't change your MFO that much through training, but you can – sorry, you can change your MFO. You can't change your fat max. Okay. <clears throat> so you can improve the rate at which you burn fat, mm. but you can't necessarily change the percentage at when you do that. So it's training. more relative to your oh, – I'm trying to even work around how that that would – Work. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to write an article on this because it was it was I was trying to get my reading the research on it and it was like effectively and it, it's a little bit confusing because what they've shown is that trained individuals have higher MFOs and have higher fat maxes. So in my head, I'm like, well, if trained people have that, then surely you can change it as you train. But yeah, they're saying that if you're even if you start training, you can't necessarily train that percentage at which. Uh, fat max occurs, but yeah. you can change the grams per minute. So you can improve your efficiency Okay. Um, yeah. of burning fat. So through is, training. Through training and diet manipulation. Okay. So which is really cool. And so you can do things like that. And yeah. that that comes down to like then periodizing carbohydrates in your diet. And I think um, you know, you can talk about ketogenic and fads and all that sort of stuff. I don't necessarily think you have to go ketogenic, you just probably have to push your fat intake up. Yep. to a certain percentage of your total calories and then mix that up with some higher days of carbohydrates based around maybe higher intensity days of training. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Sorry, where so, were we with that? Uh, we're talking about digressed. you and your <coughs> yeah, training. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I said, uh, you know, I know I need to get my VO2 up. So I sort of said to myself, right, I'm going to do at least three cardio sessions a week and I've been pretty good about sticking to that. Yeah. I, what type of sessions are you looking for? Are you swimming, running? Well, or yeah, so... Summer here, so it's I actually, not bad. I actually, weirdly enough, got swimming some swimming lessons when I was living in Boston after leaving Bermuda. Um, <laughs> and I was a lifesaver at uh, Whale Beach Surf Club for a year or so uh, when I lived in Sydney a long time ago. Oh, wow. Um, and so I just said to myself, I really want to get better at swimming because somewhere weirdly in my head, I want to do a 70.3, so a half Ironman. Yeah. Because I think it oh. would be really good uh, for my clients, just mm. for me to experience the training and the eating and just the whole practical element. Yeah. I think if you like that whole experiential learning, I think it's really important. Mm. Uh, it's a great goal. Yeah, it's a great goal. I think with all my injuries from rugby and stuff like that, I'm probably going to hurt a lot. But So I said I'd swim. So like this morning, I did a kilometre down in, yep. next to the wharf or whatever that netted area is. Oh, yeah, at the office in Manly. Yeah, down yeah. there. So what do you call it? The office. The office, yeah. Oh, okay. That's between the wharf and, and the, the skiff club. No, oh, no, okay. The so the, you were on the other side. You're further in. Okay. I was in like the tourist net. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you did it 1K within the net? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I was just swimming back yeah. and forward. So, Are you uh, scared of the sharks? Well, no, I did the. <laughs> I, I, I'm doing the bold and the beautiful, is yep. it? Yeah. Yep. So I did sort of a half version of that the other day with a colleague here at True. And um, oh, so you went from South Stain to Shelley and walked back? Yeah, well, no, I didn't even go all the way from South Stain. It was so rough that day oh, that we yep. jumped in sort of just around the corner yep. and swam that back and forth. And that was really cool. And Beautiful um, there, eh? Yeah, it's amazing. But it was so rough. And all the locals were like, geez, we haven't seen it this rough in about 12 months. And I was like, great. <laughs> and they're like, how many times have you done ocean swim? I was like, none. And they were like, well, it's only going to get better. So. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so I think one of my, and again, it's like limitations you place on yourself. I'm like telling myself, oh, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. And then you get in the water and you're like, oh, I can do this. Yeah. And so I, I'm really working hard on um, just pushing myself in that direction. Uh, so fitness wise, yeah, 
doing that, back in the gym, lifting, you mm. know, doing what, four, three, three weight sessions a week with some hits sort of combined with that. Yep. That's been really good. And when you go in to lift weights, uh, what more specifically type of lift are you doing that you prefer? Um, so at the moment, the program I'm on is like a, it's an upper program with push pull. Uh, and then a lower push pull and then I do a total body. So I do a Monday, Tuesday, Friday split. Um, I like uppers, like, you know, bench press, uh, chin ups, pull ups, uh, variations of, um, pushes, things like that. Um, mm. it's, it's a program written by Craig. Uh, and then the, uh, generally speaking, he, the way he works is like do some strength stuff at the start. So like fairly heavy. So like five fives, things like that, yep. uh, two sets of five, three sets of three <clears throat> as the weeks progress. Uh, and then the lower is like deadlift, uh, again, like two fives, three three sort of thing. And then mm. getting into sort of some more hypertrophy type stuff. So higher reps, yeah, um, still keeping volume up. And then the total body is just a killer and it's like everything and you're just dying at the <laughs> just end of to it. So, <laughs> finish you off again. <clears throat> Pretty much. Yeah. And then he tries to put in some cardio sessions on Wednesday. And I do yoga. Like I've, I've realized the benefits of mobility as you get older. And I just <laughs> wish I did yoga when I was young. Like yeah. It's, I tell everyone, I'm like, just do. I used to hate yoga as a physio too. I'd be like, oh, it's so bad. Oh, really? Like bending forwards all the time and twisting and that. And <laughs> I'd be like, you need to do Pilates. Like I used to teach Pilates on like reformers and that. And yeah. Like I was so against yoga and now I'm like, I just love yoga. It's it's great. That's awesome. That's <laughs> something that you've changed your mind on pretty Massively. Strongly. And I still mm. think Pilates is good. Mm. Um, I think it's horses for courses. I, I like mixing it up. Like I've been going down to, is it Power Living? Yes, in Manly. In Manly, mm -hmm. and the girls there, like all the train, or what do you call them? Teachers. Teachers, yeah. They're, they're really good. I mean, some of them are just crazy hard sessions. I've heard that, that it's, <laughs> you know, people think they're going to go to yoga and it'll be easy and boring, but it doesn't sound like that at all Man, from what I, I understand. I, I, I sweat badly anyway, so I'm just dripping sweat everywhere. I feel really bad for people next to me. <laughs> I think um, that's pretty common though. Yeah. yeah. Um, Is it, so it's not in an air conditioned room there? Oh, I think sometimes it's they do it hot. hot and yoga, I'm like, yeah. why are we doing it hot in <laughs> Australia? It's fine in Boston and stuff like that, where in England, where it's like freezing all the time in Toronto. But uh, yeah, yeah, here, hot yoga sort of in the middle of summer. It's sort of, I don't know, it sort of messes with my head. Yeah. Um, so I think yoga has been really cool getting into that and just trying to improve my flexibility, especially like thoracic. And mm, I just find back. like, and even as a physio, I used to always say to people, people with neck problems, I think it's just all related to probably more anterior. <clears throat> like everyone always oh, focuses. Really? So a lot of physios I find, or a lot of people like really focus on the posterior aspect of them. So you got a sore neck, they'll play with your neck, they'll you know, yes, you'll mobilize the thoracic spine, stuff like that, but they forget that like a lot of it's probably coming from, so you have the concept of antagonist agonist. So, and I don't want to get too complicated with muscle spindles and things like <laughs> that, but effectively if, if they're activated all the time, it's because they're on stretch. So if you think about like a normal posture, say being rounded over, mm. then effectively all those muscles across your back are always on stretch. So they're yep. always activated. Now, how do you take them off stretch by going the other way? So that's usually related to, say, like a lot of pec minor, pec major, scalenes, uh, so neck muscles, the anterior neck muscles through there. And yeah. Scalenes is that scalenes here, through the upper through neck. Through the front of the yeah. neck. And yeah. then, you know, through the chest. And then you get people to do some sort of, uh, you know, pec mobility, shoulder mobility stuff. And they're just, I, I was doing it with my sister the other day in terms of getting her to, like, do some of these stretches and, she just couldn't do any of it. I was blown mm. away and like, she's got terrible neck problems. And then I did it with another mate who's got really bad neck problems and yeah, posture comes into it and neck mm. position and keyboards and all that sort of stuff as well. Smartphones. Yeah. All these sorts of, you know, again, it's multifactorial, isn't it? Mm. But like, same thing, he just couldn't do any of these sort of movements, which I was like, wow, your shoulder mobility is just horrendous. Mm. And so I think if you, you know, you start to work on that sort of mobility and people start thinking a little bit outside the box of maybe it's not my neck and, you know, the old, you know, the song, the neck bones connect to the shoulder bone and the spine and, you know, <laughs> yeah. shoulder bones connected to the elbow bone and so on. And like you start thinking in that some more holistic way and yeah. it's, uh, I think you can get pretty good results.
Yeah, I, I hear the expression like upstream and downstream a lot. So it's yep. not necessarily, let's say if you're, you know, you got elbow pain, it could come from your bicep or your forearm or something. Yeah, Might be wrong, upstream or downstream. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Again, it's, you know, that agonist, antagonist. Things work mm. against each other and they create tension because something else is not quite right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, the number of people I get told have tennis elbow or golf elbow and you're like, how often do you play golf? And like, I haven't played golf <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, it's not golfer's elbow, is it? It's yeah. just, you've got a problem in your elbow and let's work out why. That's a good point. And then it's problem solving, you know, you, then you, you know, it's not a recipe. It's like trying to explore that patient, you know, no different from nutrition. You're mm. trying to get to where the issues lie and then what can you do about it? So yeah. Everything, most things are fixable. Yeah, or at least they can get better. <clears throat> I think almost everything can get a little bit better. I think everything yeah. can get better. You can get better a lot. <laughs> so your training is really varied. Where are you? And since, you know, uh, maybe a 70.3 is your goal at the end of a lot of this, uh, are you going on the road bike at all? Um, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, so I joined uh, Anytime Fitness just because I had to. Because <laughs> there was nothing. Well, there was lots, but it was just cheap and cheerful. And, you know, it's got lifting platforms and yeah. Yeah, weights are weights pretty much in my world. Um, it just doesn't have much culture there. <laughs> so, you know, it's a bit boring to be fair. So I just joined B Athletic actually and oh, wow. giving yeah. them a trial awesome. for a couple of weeks and see how that goes. So yeah. I'll probably go this afternoon and kill myself. Yeah. Um, so building up to that, one of my good mates, he's uh, in North Cork Curl. Uh, he's done a lot of 70.3s. His name's Ian Gard. He's like a tri coach and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. then, I'm going to start working with him and see how I go. He's got two bikes, so he said he'd uh, probably lend me a bike at least Excellent. to start me off and get me on the bike and start working. He says my yeah. calves are small anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Rude. He's like, you need to get on the bike. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'll, I'll probably start doing that. And I know he's a good swimmer, and so he'll probably push me in that respect and uh, we'll start running together. So, yeah. you know, it's I've got to drop, I reckon, about 87 kilos and then so I reckon I've got to drop probably seven or eight kilos and I'll probably look really sick if I do that. So. <laughs> You'll be shredded. There's a couple of guys at Be Athletic that do the Warringah triathlons, like yep. the really short yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. saw that. Andrew and Hannah and there's a couple of guys there. So when you get to know people there, just ask around. And yeah, see. cool. Yeah, you can get going. I think they're, they're for one, they're very cheap triathlons to sign up for because some of these triathlons are really expensive. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like 40 bucks if you're a member, 60 if you're not. And they do um, a short little swim. I believe they do then do a run and then a bike and a run. So not traditional triathlon setup, but still you get to, you know, experience a little bit of what the transitions are and what the what it is going from one movement to another, which I yep. think can be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I think I need to work on that. I'll yeah. start small and then work. I don't, I, again, it comes down to practice. I think I'd be an idiot if I just went straight into a 70.3 <laughs> and died. Well, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be an interesting experiment at least. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure it would be. <laughs> yeah. so. that's, like, that's a typical CrossFit attitude. They're like, I'm not going to train for a marathon. I'm not going to train for this and that. And then they forget that when they're in the gym, they're just doing 20 minute workouts and they haven't built up the volume required to be on your feet or something like that for a month much longer duration so a lot of the times these experiments they they be, they're able to finish them but they're sore for you know 20 days after <laughs> it's like it, it, enjoyment has to come into it and i think that's, yeah that's a that's big a point. point with clients is like okay you're, you're not gonna win mm. the triathlon but we want you to finish it with a smile on your face yeah. and like feel good about it so that you want to do another one yeah it's not like that was the worst experience of my life and i am never going <laughs> anywhere near that again like yeah. you want them to feel like man if <clears throat> if only i like did this a little bit better or i reckon i could have done this better and yeah you know that's such cool feedback when you get that from people and they're like oh, okay i can't wait to do the next one you're like okay now it that's, that's cool awesome. yeah so. that's such a good way to look at it yeah. all right to round this off i want to talk to you a bit about what a general week of eating looks like for you scott what are some of the things that you try and tick off to make sure that it's a fairly healthy week, but also what are some of the things that you do because you want to enjoy life as well, right? Which is most of us. We're not, I don't think any of us are um, pure athletes in the sense that we're trying to make the Olympics in Japan in 2020 or, um, you know, we're not really trying to make the CrossFit Games or anything like that. Maybe, maybe some of the listeners are, but in general, we're just trying to live, live a healthy life. So what does a week from Monday till Sunday 
on average look like? It, I, I'll just go back one step where you said, um, like, how do you make things last from eight weeks to 12 months? I think the biggest thing is like a relationship with food. And if you don't cook, then you're never going to succeed. You don't have a relationship with food if you don't cook. You don't. And I think it's such a it's such an important point that people have to cook. Like I went and checked out an apartment the other day and there's no oven there. And I'm like, what? What? Yeah, no oven. I was like, wow. And I, I hear things like in New York now, they're building apartments without kitchens. Uber Eats every day. Uber Eats. Wow. That's and I think, sad. Well, I even had my nieces talking about Uber Eats the other day and they're like, but it does everything. It's amazing. And I'm like, oh God. And you're like, the thing is, like, no matter how healthy you think that food is, you're eating from Uber Eats, and I'm not slamming Uber Eats here, I'm whatever delivery service you might get, any takeaway is just going to be food that is most likely cooked in a lot of fat or a lot of sugar added to it because it makes it taste and smell amazing, and that's what you're paying for. <clears throat> and the quality of the ingredients probably aren't going to be that high as well when we go back to nutrient density and things like that. So... I think really establishing that relationship with food and cooking and not only does it like improve your general health, it can also save you a lot of money. So like the ideal thing to take to work for lunch is leftovers, you know, and just make too much for yourself at night, be disciplined enough not to go back for seconds. And you, you'll find that, you know, once you start doing that, you, you just, things just start to roll. So, you know, my typical week is cooking. Um, I'll tend to cook pretty much every night. Um, I won't like, obviously if I'm going out, I'm, I'm, you know, if I go out on a date or something like that, <laughs> not many of them at the moment. Um, you're putting the feelers out Yeah, there. just throw, <laughs> throwing it out there, you know. Um, you know, if, uh, if I go out, fine, I'll eat out and I'll tend to, if I do eat out, I'll tend to try and choose a healthier choice on the meal, on the menu. Like, you know, mm. if I, I usually try and pick fish actually, cause fish is generally quite difficult to cook for a lot of people i find so ah oh, so um, you mean they would take more care if they cook fish yeah um but also like cooking fish at home i don't know i stuff it up. i think fish is one of the hardest things to cook really well mm. um i can cook salmon but any other type of fish i tend to just either overcook it or undercook it <laughs> so uh. um so yeah i'll tend to so my week Generally consists of uh, cooking, uh, not nothing complicated. I use the barbecue a lot. I love, like, it's so good being home. And, like, mm. even in Toronto, like, in minus 30, I'd be out on the balcony <laughs> barbecuing in the snow and stuff. Yeah. But it's so good because you don't have to clean up. So, like I say to everyone, use your barbecue. Like, yeah. you can do, you know, your chicken, steak, fish. Um, you can do veggies on there, char grill, your broccoli, your capsicum, mm. do all that sort of eggplant. You can do so much on the barbecue. It just requires a little bit of sort of uh, thought and you know, ingenuity. Um, do that. Generally prep, well not prep, but just put my leftovers in uh, in a Tupperware container and then I'm ready to go. Mm. Um, as do I said. Do you cook the same every week or do you try and no. mix it up and get, do you find inspiration somewhere if you do? Yeah, so, I mean, I think we're all creatures of habit. I think we like things that, you know, are easy to cook and mm. uh, we like the taste of. So I'll go through phases. I mean, I did a, I mean, many, many years ago, I did a cooking course in Thailand. So I love, like, those oh, wow. Southeast Asian flavors. So I Spicy? Yeah, I love spice and I love, like, fresh herbs, like coriander and mint. So I'll do a lot of salads with coriander and mint and things like that. But I'll do, like, Thai curries stir fries a lot of stir fries things like that mm. just because they're really simple and you can get so many like vegetables into it and make it taste really cool and generally like, healthy right it's really fry. healthy i mean if you're not adding a hell of a lot of sweet chili sauce <laughs> and, you, you know sugar <laughs> extra sugar and all that they're pretty good um yeah so yeah i'll do that um yeah it's it's pretty easy like i mean yeah. inspiration um there's a guy called yotam otolenghi um, oh, he's. Uh, I've seen the book. Oh, it's amazing. Tulangi, yeah, it's that's so right. good. And honestly, if you're if you are listening and you want some inspiration for salads, then get his book. Uh, plenty, plenty more. And he's got a new book called Simple. Mm. Um, I do not work for Yotam Tulangi. <laughs> I just recommend his books to like a lot of people, just because they're such interesting salads, really cool ingredients, really simple, and just like it blows you away with like the flavors. And you're like, wow, salads don't have to be like 
rocket and tomato and red onion sort of thing. I love rocket salad. So do I. I love it as well. But some like, people don't like it. If you if you yeah, if you looked at my typical salad, it's either rocket or um like baby spinach with I'll either go like I'll try and think like, oh I'm Mediterranean today and I'll put goat's cheese in there and some, you know, red onion and tom tomatoes and maybe some parmesan or something like that. Or then the other one will be like um uh, I don't know. Um Oh God, like a quinoa and red onion and sweet potato and stuff like that. But yeah. it's, it's pretty simple. Yum. So yeah, I keep it simple and just try and I, I honestly just try and cook for myself as much as possible because I know then I'm in control of it. Mm. Not that I'm a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> Not as bad as you. <laughs> Do you have dessert? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a sucker. Do you know what I've been buying is uh, Tim Tams. I love it. Cause oh, because you're Tim back Tams. in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have this packet of Tim Tams in my fridge and uh, it's, apparently it's really controversial if you keep your Tim Tams in the fridge. I think they're a hundred times better when they're in the fridge. Massively. Mm. But uh, yeah, I read this really weird comment on <laughs> a dating app the other day saying, <laughs> let's discuss keeping Tim Tams in the fridge or not. And I was like, what? What? Like, so anyway, I have a, I have a Tim Tam, uh, most nights. It's like my little guilty pleasure. So oh, that's mad. It's pretty cool. And yeah. I'm a sucker for ice cream. So I oh, tend, I this tend, time of year. I tend not to have ice cream in my freezer because if it is there, I'll eat like the whole tub. Yeah. The, the, I love ice cream, especially now in <clears> summer as well. But the downside is if I eat too, or even if I eat ice cream at all, um, in the evening after dinner, my sleep is way worse really for me yeah I th th that that and um and some pizzas if i eat that late my sleep is just terrible I've, I've been very i've been tracking my sleep a lot lately okay, okay. <laughs> i'm a bit obsessed with my sleep and that running the offices yeah and that that ice cream definitely yeah. affects it so i find i find if i have a high carbohydrate feed prior to sleep mm. um especially if i'm a bit tired it actually induces better sleep yeah wow yeah um and actually a lot of the research supports that so it's it's an interesting yeah. strategy to use but i think like i can see how it can also affect you because you suddenly get this like massive sugar but i think mm. it, it may come down to again maybe the quality of the carbohydrates you're eating yeah i think if you have a lot of refined sugar then possibly you are you know maybe you are getting some type of buzz and it's yeah. keeping you up so it is very individual, but from what I understand, if your body has to metabolize a lot of the food late, it, it might affect your sleep. And it's not that you, uh, I should say that it's not necessarily that you're not sleeping, but the actual quality, quality. of the sleep is worse. So yeah. what I've been trying to get more and more of is deep sleep, which is when your body recovers. Yep. And that's where I see the effects. It's like if I have... Ben and Jerry's, I'm screwed. There's like no deep sleep at all at night. Just tossing and turning. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm still out. I still sleep a fair bit, but yeah, the quality um, does affect. Yeah, it does affect it. Yeah. All right. Well, Scott, that was a really awesome chat. Thank you so much yeah, for coming really on. Fun. I really think fun. Uh, I would love to have you back on the show after you've been at True for a little while, because we can talk a bit more about the stuff that you've been doing. You've, you're still pretty new here and you're kind of finding the things that you were excited about and you want to do. But I yeah. think within a year or so, you, you've, you've made a real change here um, at that point, I think. So it's going to be fun to see where, where it goes. Yeah, awesome. awesome. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Me. Thank you. Cheers.